morning. Welcome uh, to the Parkway Church. My name is Jeff, one of the pastors here. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. As Dave just read, we will be in verses uh, 1 through 6. And uh, as you're turning there, I want you to think of some examples of foods that you used to eat at some point in life, but you no longer do for some reason. So maybe that's because you, uh, you grew up and you didn't have a lot of money, and uh, so you had to eat really weird things. Uh, there's a member of our church who uh, uh, tells about how they used to, to eat spam casserole whenever they, were, uh, when, whenever they were a kid. And I happen to like casseroles, but whenever you add spam into it, I'm, I'm out, right? I don't want a spam burger or spam and eggs or something like that. And uh, neither does this member because once they grew up and decided I have my own money, I'm not going to spend it on spam. I'm going to instead spend it on actual food. And so uh, that was maybe one of the reasons that you no longer eat it. Or maybe it was something that you had to eat as a kid just because your parents made you. For example, when I was a kid, we would occasionally uh, hunt and then fry and then eat squirrels. Uh, Now that I'm an adult, I decide I'm not going to eat rodents. That's just kind of one of my uh, my kind of rules in uh, life, or maybe it's because you learned something about a particular food and so you no longer uh, eat it. Maybe you used to really love the awesome blossom at Chili's and then you realized it's 2,700 calories and you thought, maybe I don't want to spend all of my caloric intake for the day on uh, this one particular thing, or maybe you don't care about calories and Chili's just stopped offering it, which is another reason to hate Chili's. Uh, or maybe you watch some sort of a documentary about the food production process, the food industry that makes you no longer want to eat something. Uh, that's why I choose to, cert- to, to not watch certain documentaries, because I think <laughs> ignorance is bliss. I took a class in college. Uh, the class was called Food Toxicology. And, uh, and one of the things that they did in that class is they made us watch this uh, video about the production of ketchup. And uh, did you know that the government actually regulates the number of worms... That could be included in ketchup. The answer is not zero. I think the answer should be zero, but the answer is not zero. And, uh, and so for that entire semester, I didn't eat ketchup. I eventually got over it, and I eat ketchup today. What's my point? Well, sometimes what you know about a certain food will affect whether or not you eat that food. Uh, sometimes knowledge leads to eating less or none of that food, as uh, we just talked about. Uh, you learn the ingredients, you learn the production process, you learn the caloric intake or the worm intake or something like that. So you cut back or you refrain from that food altogether. Or sometimes it's the exact opposite. Sometimes uh, what you know about food actually leads to eating more. All right? I don't really love the taste of quinoa or jicama or something like that, but I sometimes eat it uh, because I happen to have inherited the world's worst genetics. I either eat vegetables or I die. That's basically my, uh, my options. And so the point uh, is that knowledge about food can lead to eating more of that food or it can lead to eating less of that food. And that's the principle that we'll see in uh, 1 Corinthians. As we've transitioned from talking about marriage, which we've talked about over the past few weeks from chapter 7, uh, from marriage and singleness, into this ta- topic of food sacrifice to idols. So we'll be talking about this actually on and off over the next few weeks, but today we begin to kind of lay the theological foundation. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in together. Father, I pray for, uh, for your help. I pray that you would do uh, what only you can do. I confess that, uh, that you're good. I confess that we need uh, hearts that uh, rest uh, in your sovereignty and in your grace and your mercy to us. And so I pray that you would protect us. Protect us from uh, legalism. The, we would not be those who would forbid the foods that you have created for us to enjoy. But you would also protect us from being those who... Uh, eat or drink in a way that doesn't take into account uh, others and the body and love and faith and those kinds of things. And so I pray uh, that you would help us this morning because you're good and you do good. So I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Now, before we, uh, we really dive into this particular text, let's kind of uh, get an idea of the context. We've already seen over the past few months that, uh, that Corinth is an ecclesiological train wreck. It's not the kind of church that you would recommend to your buddy. It's this dumpster fire of problems. A man is sleeping with his stepmom, 
People are going to see temple prostitutes. People are suing each other. They're withholding uh, sex from their spouses. There's division. There's pride. It's an episode of Jerry Springer. We aren't even halfway through the book yet. And that's the, those are the things that we've already seen. In coming weeks, we'll see even more problems. People are getting drunk during communion. Uh, people, other people are eating all the communal, communal meal before others get there. Uh, they're fighting about spiritual gifts. There are even some that are denying the resurrection there in Corinth. So this isn't a very, what we would call a healthy church. If you ever kind of think, I'm going to get back to the good old days uh, of the church before it was polluted, before it was corrupted, this certainly wasn't them. In fact, there's never been that sort of idea. Christ's bride is always going to be spotted and uh, with blemishes and so forth until he returns and, uh, and makes her new. So then we get to chapter 8 here in uh, 1 Corinthians and we start talking about food sacrifice to idols. And this topic won't actually just be restricted to chapter 8. It will actually provide this unifying theme that runs from chapters 8 all the way through uh, chapter 10. In fact, these three chapters, 8, 9, and 10, are one long related argument related to Christian liberty and freedom. And how our liberty, how our freedom in Christ should relate to and be filtered through love and faith. So as we walk through it, we'll see these two dangers that we need to avoid. I even prayed about it uh, earlier. The first danger is legalism. That is that we prohibit what God has not forbidden. And the second is selfishness. That is that we exercise our rights uh, without uh, taking into account uh, others, without any sort of concern for others. And we'll see that over the coming weeks. So, uh, so in a sense, what we're doing today is just kind of laying a foundation that we're going to build on over the next uh, few uh, weeks. And so uh, we're always tempted, as people, we're always tempted to swing the pendulum from one uh, to uh, the other. To overreact, to, to overreact, to overcorrect, uh, where Scripture tells us to avoid actually both legalism and this sort of selfishness. Now, as it relates to food and drink in the context of this letter, there is this tendency that we have to either forbid what, what shouldn't be forgiven or to exercise our rights without any concern for others. Again, we'll see that in, uh, in the coming weeks. So the issue here in uh, 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 isn't just food sacrificed to idols. The issue here is Christian freedom. How are we free? Are we free? And if we're free, how are we then to steward that liberty? How are we to steward that, uh, that freedom in love? And the particular example that he's going to use through most of chapters 8 through 10 is food sacrificed to idols. Now, you and I probably don't deal with this particular issue all that often in life, right? I don't go to Luby's and think this fried fish was sacrificed to Poseidon, right? So most of us don't really have to think about the category of food sacrificed to idols. But that doesn't mean that these chapters are irrelevant because we absolutely deal with the larger theme. We absolutely deal with the larger context, the larger category of what is called adiaphora. Adiaphora, which is a word that refers to things which are neither commanded nor condemned in Scripture. We talked about these quite a bit way back in Romans 14. Let me give you a few examples. Whether you drink alcohol or not, that's an issue that's called adiaphora. Whether you can play poker uh, or smoking a cigar or working on a Sunday or getting tattoos or piercings, these are all adiaphora. There's neither command nor prohibition. So the particular problem in Corinth, that is food sacrifice to idols, isn't an issue for us. That's not a problem for us. But the underlying principle absolutely is. This is this universal uh, sort of issue for us. And one of the things that we'll see is that the reason that you do or that you don't do something, whether you eat or you don't eat or drink or don't drink, the reason matters. Your motivation in eating or drinking or not eating or not drinking matters. For example, let's imagine, if you will, that you're a vegetarian. Is that okay? Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec wouldn't approve, right? But there is absolutely, actually no universal command in the Bible to eat meat. There's no universal command that says you have to eat meat. So it's fine. If you want to abstain from, uh, from eating meat because you think it's more healthy, that's absolutely okay. You might be right. You might be wrong. We can have that argument. It's okay. It doesn't matter. But if you don't eat meat because you think that killing cows is murder, if you think that eating meat is somehow morally wrong, that's a problem. 
if God didn't want us to eat cows, he wouldn't have made them out of steak, right? As one, uh, as one pastor said, we don't believe in justification by carrots or sanctification by salad or something. The Bible actually explicitly clear, the Bible's actually explicitly clear that it's not morally sinful or even foolish to have an occasional steak or hamburger or something like that. Or take another example. Take bacon. I love bacon. Let's say you don't love bacon, right? Is that okay? Again, I don't think so, but for the sake of argument, it depends. Why don't you love bacon? Do you have this heart condition? So you try to avoid greasy meats? That's an okay reason to refrain from bacon. Are you just trying to lose weight, so you're trying to avoid bacon? That's also okay. You don't have to eat bacon. There is no command in scriptures that says, thou shalt eat bacon. That one didn't make it down the mountain, right? It should be in there, but it isn't. So it's okay to not eat bacon. But if the reason that you refrain is because you think that pork is morally unclean, it's because you want to get in touch with your Jewish roots, something like that, that's a problem. The New Testament is unambiguously clear that we're no longer under the Mosaic uh, commandment and therefore all food is clean. In fact, the Bible strongly condemns the idea that there is any spiritual benefit at all in refraining from pork or doing other Jewish things, right? The irony is that those who would refrain from, from pork for spiritual reasons, they're, like they're showing faith, like they're actually strong, in, in reality are showing ignorance and weakness. Or one last uh, ex- example is alcohol. If you don't uh, drink alcohol because you just don't like the taste, that's totally fine. You're not required to drink. Now, now that reason doesn't actually apply to wine and communion. God doesn't care whether, the, uh, whether or not you like the taste of his sacrament. We're actually going to talk about that more in uh, member meeting this, uh, uh, this next month. But not drinking just socially because you don't like the taste is totally fine. But if you abstain from alcohol because you think that drinking is unholy or unwise, that's a problem. If you think it's somehow holier or wiser or spiritually better to not drink, then you have to reconcile with that with the fact that Jesus actually drank. Whether you mean to or not, you're suggesting that Jesus was not as holy or wise or faithful. So again, you see that why you do or you don't eat or drink makes a difference. Are you doing it for health or are you doing it because you think it somehow in some way contributes to your holiness? I think far too often we simply ask whether we can do something, whether I can eat Uh, meat or drink alcohol or something like that without asking ourselves the follow-up question, why? But why is a really important question. One of the best examples of this is circumcision. If you want to get circumcised for aesthetics or for health reasons, that's totally fine. But if you want to get circumcised for the sake of adherence to the Mosaic law, Paul says that's a very, very big deal. You have forsaken the gospel. That's a huge deal. So over the past few weeks, we've been talking about marriage in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. We've referenced this, uh, this parallel passage in 1 Timothy 4, which talks about forbidding marriage. And it talks about forbidding marriage as being a teaching of demons. So I want to go back there and read that passage again because that passage isn't only about forbidding marriage, but also foods. Look at 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Notice the problem here isn't abstinence. The problem is requiring abstinence or even suggesting that abstinence from certain foods will make you more holy. That's called legalism. That is a sin. So here's the principle that I want us to keep in mind as we uh, kind of journey over the next couple of months through these three chapters. That principle is what matters is not so much whether we eat or whether we drink, but why. Paul will say there are times in which you can eat food, food sacrifice to idols, And there are times in which you can't or you shouldn't. It isn't as simple as just simply saying idle food good or idle food bad. But we'll get to that. Today we want to begin to lay that foundation by talking about 
knowledge. Let's read the passage again. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. To understand what's happening here, we need to understand a a couple of things. First, we need to bear in mind that 1 Corinthians is very much this polemical, this reactive uh, letter. Paul is responding to the context of what's going on in Corinth. The Corinthians had written him a letter and they had asked about food sacrificed to idols. So this is his response. We see that in the phrase, now concerning. Right? We've seen that, uh, that phrase a couple of times in 1 Corinthians. We'll see it a, a few more times. He's been talking about marriage uh, because that's a question in Corinth. Now he's going to talk about another issue in the church that is food offered to idols. That's the first thing we need to know is that this is a reactive, sort of responsive uh, uh, letter. Second, we need to know something about ancient Roman sacrifices. In order to understand what's going on in this text, we need to understand some, something about the Roman sacrificial system. I would imagine that apart from maybe reading a few books or watching a movie, very few of us have ever seen an actual animal sacrifice, right? The closest I've come is in college. I worked a few days in a slaughterhouse that was owned by my, uh, my best friend's uh, dad. And after an hour of, uh, of working there, I was disgusted with the process, right? I mostly just punched like meat carcasses and sang Eye of the Tiger But that was enough for me because it's really, really gross to just butcher cows all day long. And that was kind of the ancient sacrificial system, right? That's a very gross thing. In general, here's what it entailed. As a good Roman, as a good citizen of the Roman Empire, you believed in the, quote, gods. And you had a god for just about everything. You had a god for crops, you had a god for medicine, you had a god for rain, all these kinds of things. So let's say that your child gets sick. And your child is near death. Well, you think, I need to appease or persuade this God of healing or the God of medicine or something like that. So you would take an animal, and you would take that animal to the temple, and you would offer a sacrifice, perhaps to Asclepius, who is the God of uh, of medicine. And if you really wanted to make Asclepius uh, happy, you might also go see a temple prostitute. But we won't talk about that. Let's stick to the sacrifice. So you offer part of the animal uh, to the God, And then you would take the rest and you would throw this big uh, barbecue. All of your buddies would come over and they would celebrate with you. It would be this huge kind of Mardi Gras meets spring break uh, rager there. And then whatever's left over after that party, you would uh, would then uh, uh, sell in a meat market. So let's imagine that you're converted. You're converted to Christianity. And so now you ask, now that I'm a Christian... Can I offer sacrifices to the gods of Rome? And your answer is obviously no. I can't go and offer a sacrifice to these false gods. But what about going to my neighbor's barbecue? Or what about shopping for meat sold in the meat market that was uh, probably previously sold or, or sacrificed to idols? Is that okay? And there seems to be these two sides there in, uh, in Corinth. Some said that eating meat that sacrificed to idols was wrong. That's tainted meat. You can't do that. On the other side, some said, no, those idols are nothing. The the sacrifice didn't mean anything, so you can eat whatever you want. Well, where does Paul land? We'll see his answer actually over the next few weeks. He begins, though, by saying, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Notice the quotation marks there. That typically signals That this was a Corinthian slogan. We saw that, uh, we've seen that uh, already in 1 Corinthians uh, quite a bit. So this is a Corinthian slogan. This is something that the Corinthians probably had already written to him or something that was a well-known saying uh, or something like that. In other words, this isn't necessarily something that Paul is agreeing with here. He's quoting them. He's responding to their quote. He's responding to their worldview, their idea, their belief system. They think that they have knowledge. But notice what Paul is going to do. He's going to critique their so-called knowledge. He says that it actually puffs up. Now, does this this mean that all knowledge puffs up? No. Notice the word this before the word knowledge. Paul isn't saying that all knowledge necessarily puffs up, but that the Corinthians were using their knowledge for the purpose of pride. That's what's going on here. The problem in chapter 8, the problem in Corinth isn't knowledge, it's selfishness, it's lovelessness, right? In fact, I think that the problem is actually a lack of knowledge. It's deficient knowledge, it's insufficient knowledge. The problem isn't that they know too much, it's that they actually don't know enough. They know A and B and C about food sacrificed to idols, 
but they forgot to take into account D and E. You see, knowledge is a good thing. You can actually never know too much. That's not possible. Therefore, the Bible never criticizes learning. That's never a problem in the Bible. Learning is not a problem. In fact, the Bible actually commands it. The Great Commission says that we are to teach people. And Jesus commands us that we love God not only with our hearts and souls, but also with what? Our minds, right? And as Romans says, we're to be transformed, how? By the renewing of what? By the renewing of our minds. The entire Bible is actually written so that we would read it. And as we read it, we would learn, right? So knowledge isn't bad. Learning isn't bad. It's good. It's actually a virtue. But the problem in Corinth is that they are stewarding that knowledge in a way that was self-centered, in a way that was selfish, in a way that was greedy, in a way that was divisive. They were being puffed up. They were being arrogant. They were using their knowledge in a way that actually hurt others rather than for their edification and encouragement. Let's keep going. Verses 2 through 3. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Now on the surface, this again seems like he's taking this big jab at knowledge. It seems like Paul is saying, you can never really know anything at all, so why try? Why bother? That's not actually Paul's point. There's this idea, though, in, uh, in postmodern culture in particular, uh, that suggests that we don't have, because we don't have exhaustive knowledge about any topic, we can therefore have no certainty. We can't know everything about God, so we should just keep our mouths shut. We should not be dogmatic about anything. That's this big cultural virtue today. It's seen to be very humble, uh, even in certain circles of evangelicalism. For example, a couple of years ago, we posted this blog on a somewhat controversial topic, and an acquaintance from, uh, from another church reached out and said it was really arrogant for us to comment on these things because we could be wrong. She said the fact that Christians were wrong about slavery, for instance, means that we should kind of reserve judgment on uh, things like race or gender today. She said that's what it means to be a lifelong learner. If you're a lifelong learner, that means you never really take controversial uh, positions. You never really have these uh, dogmatic sort of convictions about anything. The problem with that is that that's not actually what it means in the Bible to be a lifelong learner. In fact, the Bible actually criticizes that form of, quote, lifelong learning. See 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul's going to rebuke those who, quote, are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. There's a problem when you're learning and learning and learning and learning, but not actually learning. That's what he's talking about here. As, as uh, G.K. Chesterton said, merely having an open mind is nothing. The object of opening the mind as of opening the mouth is to shut it again on something solid. If, you, uh, if your pursuit of knowledge is that you open your mind to learn new things, and you humbly acknowledge that you could be wrong, but you follow wherever the best arguments lead, that's virtuous. But if by lifelong learner we mean that we lack convictions, we never take positions on controversial issues, that's not actually humility. That's actually cowardice. It's a sin to be dogmatic about things that we shouldn't be dogmatic about. But it's also just as much a sin to fail to clearly say what God has clearly said. To say, I don't really know if Jesus is the only way. I don't really know if sexual morality is actually sinful. I don't know if the Bible actually supports gender roles. Those, the, that kind of a statement isn't actually humility. That's actually pride. It's the height of arrogance to not say what God has said, to doubt God's word. So Paul here is not criticizing knowledge. What's he criticizing? He's criticizing presumption. And pride. Notice the word imagines. That underlying Greek word is often used by Paul in context where someone assumes something about themselves that actually isn't true. We've already encountered it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you, and that word is translated there as thinks, if anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become why? So thinks, imagines, same underlying Greek word. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Galatians 6, 3. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So ironically, the problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 isn't the possession of knowledge. 
but the presumption of knowledge by those who don't actually possess it. They don't really know what they should know. And what should they know? Well, love. Notice how Paul shifts the conversation from knowing about some fact to actually uh, being known by God. And what's the fruit of being known by God? Well, it's love. Now, why does Paul move in this direction? Why does Paul move from knowledge into love. I think the reason he does so is because he's kind of redefining and he's subverting these Corinthian expectations. Remember, we've talked before about the context of ancient Corinth, right? Uh, Corinth is all about knowledge. Uh, they love philosophy. They love rhetoric. They love, quote, wisdom. They don't collect baseball cards. They have, like, philosopher cards, right? Public speakers are the people who would have been on Corinth's Got Talent or something like that. So Paul is kind of upending their their expectations as he did in earlier chapters by condemning their so-called wisdom. What 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 he was doing back then wasn't condemning wisdom. He was saying your wisdom is not actually wise. The wisdom of God is foolishness to the world and vice versa. So it was the wisdom of the world but not the wisdom of God. Likewise, he's not criticizing knowledge. He's criticizing their knowledge Because their knowledge is actually insufficient and deficient. So Paul plays on those expectations by saying that what matters is not ultimately what you know, but uh, but rather whether you are known. And if you are known, then you love. What does this have to do with idols? Here's how Corinthians uh, scholar uh, David Garland puts it. He says, he is reminding them that loving God means that they are known by God. And that draws sharp boundaries that set them apart from worshipers of false gods and delimits what they may or may not do. Those who love God and are known by God may not dally in the shrines of other gods. In other words, what he's saying here is to be known by God is a mark. It's a mark of ownership. It's a mark of lordship. And if you're owned by God, then you don't get to make your own choices apart from his will. This will be really important as we keep moving through the book. And find that even where we have freedom, sometimes God wills us to forsake that freedom for the sake of love. Halfway done. Let's keep going. Verse 4. Therefore, as to the, uh, the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. So we finally get to the point of, uh, uh, of talking about knowledge, which is that we would know uh, about idols And uh, that what we know about idols and what we know about food should affect whether or not we eat food sacrificed to idols. Does that make sense? Whether or not you eat food sacrificed to idols all depends on what you know about food and what you know about idols. That's where you begin. You begin with knowledge. You begin with understanding. Unless you know what the the Bible actually says about meat or bacon or alcohol or circumcision or Sabbath or whatever, you can't actually know whether or not to partake of those things. Much of the problem in churches today, as in churches of every generation, is that God's people don't actually know God's Word and what God says about these uh, topics. We're quick to either add things to it, we're quick to add things to God's Bible, or to take things out of it. We're intellectually lazy. We, We rely on feelings rather than study. I love little baby cows. So the idea of killing them Mean, uh, it seems so mean. So what's my response? I'm just going to eat veggies. Or the Israelites, I read the Old Testament, the Israelites didn't eat pork. That must be holy. So I'm going to uh, abstain. The problem with that is though your application might be uh, adiaphora, you don't have to eat cows. You don't have to eat pigs. Although the the application might be adiaphora, the reason is really important. So it's vital that we understand what the Bible actually says about these topics. That we don't simply do a morally neutral action for a sinful reason. Again, remember, the best example of this is uh, circumcision. Paul says it doesn't matter. Circumcision doesn't matter. Do it, don't do it, it doesn't matter. And yet he also says that if you do it for certain reasons... Like because you think that you will attain justification by it or you will attain sanctification by it. He said that's a, actually a really big problem. So the question isn't just do you eat meat sacrificed to idols or do you eat pork or do you drink alcohol, but why or why not? The action itself may be morally neutral, but your justification for the action might not. 
So as it relates to food sacrifice to idols, there are these two truths to take into account here in verse 4. Notice the quotation marks. Again, this signals that these are things that the Corinthians had written or were believing. The two things that he writes are an idol has no real existence and there is no God but one. And notice Paul actually agrees with both of these. The problem isn't what the Corinthians know, it's what they do with that knowledge, as we'll see next week. But for now, let's stick to our passage. So again, the Corinthians know two things. Indeed, all Christians should know these two things. Number one, an idol has no real existence. Right? That doesn't mean that idols are imaginary, like unicorns or Bigfoot or something. Of course idols exist, right? Idolatry is rampant throughout the Bible. You can go into pagan temples today and actually see an idol. So the point isn't that idols don't exist. The point is that the gods behind those idols don't exist. The, the point is that, the, that idols mean nothing. They're vain. They're futile. They're useless. That's a common refrain of the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah 41, 29, Behold, they, speaking of idols, are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. In other words, they can't do anything. Jeremiah 16, 20 makes the point like this. Can man make for himself gods? Such are not gods. Right? Elsewhere, the prophets will mock idolaters for not recognizing the irony of bowing down to worship something that you yourself cut down and formed. Right? Who really wears the pants in that relationship? Right? The idol or the person who made the idol? If you manufacture your own God, do you not see the irony there? Do you not see how silly that is? That's a problem. Worship should always move from creation to creator, never from the creator to his creation. So if you're worshiping something that you yourself made, that's a problem. That's ironic. So if an idol is a representation of a god, but that god doesn't actually exist, then in a sense, the idol doesn't exist. That's the point that Paul is making. That's the first point. The second point that he makes is there is no God but one. And he expounds upon that in verses 5 through 6. Or he writes, For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So when it comes to the question, if someone were to ask you how many gods are there, there are a number of different possible answers. There's one true answer. There's a number of ways you could answer it, right? If you're an atheist, you would say what? He says none, right? That's what atheism means. You put an alpha privative in front of something and it means uh, that there are no gods, all right? Then you have polytheism, which says that there are how many? Many, right? That's what poly means, all right? Polytheism means many gods. And then within polytheism, you have a subcategory. It's called henotheism. What's henotheism? Henotheism is a form of polytheism in which you say there are a variety of gods. There are a number of gods. There are a plethora uh, of gods, but one of those gods is more supreme, right? Most favorite God, all right? So maybe you worship dozens of gods, but you really revere Zeus as being the highest of utmost supremacy. And in general, Roman culture was polytheistic or henotheistic. According to uh, ancient records uh, in, uh, in Corinth in particular, they revered a number of so-called gods. They revered Kronos and Poseidon, they revered the sun and the sea. They, re- they revered a god called the calm. They revered Aphrodite, Artemis, Isis, not the terror group, Dionysius, Fortune, Apollo, Hermes, Zeus, the aforementioned Asclepius. There's even evidence of them worshiping a tree in ancient uh, Corinth. So there are lots of, quote, so-called gods in Corinth. But Paul's point is those gods are not gods. So if they're not gods, are they nothing? Are those idols nothing? Well, the answer is yes and no. In a sense, that idol is nothing because there's no God behind that idol. But in another sense, it is something because behind every false God is a demon. We're not really going to explore that all that much uh, today. We'll actually get to it in chapter 10 where Paul will write this in verses 19 through 20. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. So there's a sense in which an idol is nothing, but in another sense it's something. It's not a God, 
It's a so-called God. It's a false God. It's a demon. We'll explore that more over the coming weeks. But in light of that, when someone worships, let's say, Allah, what do we say? We say they're worshiping a demon. When someone worships Ganesh, they're worshiping a demon. When someone worships Zeus, they're worshiping a demon. When someone worships whatever Tom Cruise is selling, they're worshiping a demon. They may be sincere, but sincerity is no virtue when you're sincerely engaging in idolatry, false worship. In other words, the fact that idols are nothing doesn't mean that worshiping them is harmless. Whatever is worshipped is in some sense a god to the worshiper. So if what is worshipped is not God, then behind that idol is a demon. N.T. Wright says this about the passage. I don't think we have it uh, for the screen. But he wrote, uh, The pagan pantheon cannot be dismissed as metaphysically non-existent and therefore morally irrelevant. It signals an actual phenomenon within the surrounding culture that must be faced and dealt with, not simply sidestepped. In other words, you can't just simply say an idol is nothing, therefore food sacrifice to idols mean nothing in, what, in any context uh, whatsoever. There are lots of so-called gods, he makes clear, but there's only one true God. In contrast to atheism and polytheism and henotheism or even pantheism is what is called monotheism, the belief in one God. Not just any one God, not the vehemently non-Trinitarian God of Islam, for example. No, the one true eternal God, and that God is Trinitarian. He's Father, He's Son, He's Spirit. One God who eternally exists as three distinct uh, persons, differentiated not by their nature, but rather, because they share the same nature, but rather by their relationship to each other. The Father is unbegotten. The Son is begotten of the Father. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And along with these distinctions in regards to their relationships, they have different roles. Take your salvation, for instance. If someone were to ask you, are you saved by the Father, the Son, or the Spirit, how would you answer? Yes, right? That's the proper answer. All of the above. The Father has ordained it. He sent the Son. The Son accomplishes our salvation by His life, death, and resurrection. The Spirit applies it to us through regeneration and indwelling us and so forth. And the same can be said of any of God's works because all of God's works are triune because God Himself is triune. Each member of the Trinity has different roles, but each is involved in every action of God. There is no work that the Father and the Son do that's apart from the Spirit or it's not like the father, he's, you know, he's really old. He's getting ready to retire, so he's kind of turning the business over to his son. He does all the work while he naps, right? God is triune. Everything he does is marked by that triunity, but they have different roles. Notice the prepositions here. The father from whom and the son through whom. The father uh, for whom and, uh, and so forth. You'll sometimes hear us even pray. We pray to the father through the son and by the Spirit to kind of reflect that Trinitarian uh, uh, relationship because they each have unique roles and responsibilities. The Father originates, the Son accomplishes, the Spirit applies. Now Paul's point here in 1 Corinthians is not to give this full-fledged articulation of the Trinity. Notice he doesn't even mention the Spirit here. He mentions the Father and he mentions uh, Jesus. And it almost seems like he's saying that Jesus isn't God. It kind of looks like that on the surface, at least in, the, in uh, our translations. There's one God. The Father, and then there's one Lord Jesus. So the Father is God, but Jesus is something else. That's what it seems like. That's not actually what he means. That is what it seems like. Generally, when Paul uses the word theos, God, uh, he's referring to the Father. That's generally how he does so. And then when he refers to the Son, he uses kurios, uh, another word that means Lord. That doesn't mean that the Son isn't God. That's just Paul's way of distinguishing among uh, the persons. But there may be also uh, something else that's happening below the surface here because the word Lord is often connected to uh, to not just Jesus in his deity, but Jesus in his particular messianic role of being the Christ, the anointed one, the king uh, of Israel. The person of the Son, the Son of God, is the Son of God from eternity. But he's only Lord in this messianic sense, the sense of being the one who fulfills this Abrahamic and Mosaic and Davidic uh, covenants. He's only king. He's, he's only offspring of Israel uh, by uh, virtue of his incarnation and his resurrection. So Paul could be uh, kind of hinting at that here, that Jesus is the one true Lord in the sense of being the true king, the anointed Messiah, the one to rule and reign. Uh, 
to fulfill this expectation that you see throughout the Old Testament that, that creates a bit of a tension, which is that God himself says, I will sit on the throne. And then you also have an offspring of David is going to sit on the throne. So how can both of those things be true? Well, because of the God-man. Because Jesus is the eternal son of God, but he's also the incarnate uh, man. But in general, it just seems like what Paul's doing here is just paralleling the language of verse 5. Other religions have so-called gods and so-called lords. We have one God. We have one Lord. So rather than denigrating Jesus, this text actually does the opposite. It's not placing him on a kind of a lower level of the deity hierarchy or something like that. It's actually exalting him to his rightful place uh, on the throne. And in light of that, everything else is a false god. That's Paul's point uh, here. Now to this point, Paul has just kind of agreed with the Corinthians, right? Idols don't represent gods because uh, uh, the one true God is only represented actually in his son. He's the image of the invisible God. So idols don't matter. Which means that when you eat meat that is sacrificed to an idol, that meat is not actually polluted. That meat is not actually uh, tainted or something like that uh, because that idol doesn't actually mean anything. That meat doesn't belong to Asclepius. That meat doesn't belong to Zeus. That meat doesn't belong to Artemis or Aphrodite or something like that. God made that meat. So it's therefore not prohibited. It's not un- unclean. And idols don't matter. And yet all, all of that is true, but there's uh, something else to keep in mind, which we'll talk about over the next few weeks, which is love for brother and sister. In other words, in eating and drinking, our knowledge about food and drink is necessary But it's not totally sufficient to answer the question of whether or when we should or shouldn't imbibe. We also need to consider how our eating or drinking affects others. Though I would imagine not in the way that you might have been brought up to think in evangelical culture. We'll turn to that next week. For now, I just want to end by previewing something we'll see in the coming weeks. Uh, And the the reason that I want to do that is so that we can kind of begin to prepare our hearts Uh, for where uh, we're going, for the road ahead. One of the things that we're going to see over the next, the coming weeks, again, the next three chapters are on this this kind of extended uh, subject. And so as we prepare our hearts for that, one of the coming, the, the, the things that we'll see in the coming weeks is that Paul is going to constantly defer to the weaker brother. That's actually the language we saw in Romans 14. The weaker brother is the one who's afraid to eat meat, sacrifice to idols because of his conscience. So Paul tells the strong not to eat meat around uh, the weak. So you have the weaker brother, you have the weaker sister, uh, sister, and that's one category. And Paul says to defer to them. But how most of us probably grew up hearing this, and we'll talk about this next week, there's another category of people who are, quote-unquote, offended by our eating and drinking. But they're offended not just because they're a weaker brother or sister, they're offended actually for totally different reasons, all right? They're offended because of Phariseeism. They're offended because of legalism. Bear in mind, if you will, Christ's ministry. Think about all of the times that people are offended by Christ. They're offended by Christ healing on the Sabbath. They're offended when he doesn't perform ceremonial washings. They're offended when he turns water into wine. They're offended whenever Jesus did all of these uh, certain acts. Jesus is constantly offending people, and yet he does it. Why does he do it, right? Jesus didn't refrain from drinking wine or from working on the Sabbath or from breaking traditions, even though others were offended by his doing so. So there's a really big difference between deferring to the weaker brother and deferring to legalism. How do we distinguish those? We'll see that next week. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, your word. I just confess that in uh, in all of our hearts there lurks a a tendency towards selfishness. And there lurks in our hearts a, a tendency towards legalism. Every single one of us, those who are most opposed to legalism, those who are most opposed to licentiousness, whatever it might be, that in all of our hearts there's pride and there's legalism, and there's a host of other sins. And so I pray that you would help us as we uh, journey through these uh, three chapters over the next uh, couple of, uh, of weeks or months.
Lord, that you would expose our hearts, that uh, if we are uh, offended by what we hear, that we might uh, take that offense to you. And we might recognize it's a good thing to be offended by your word if that offense is actually uh, a result of uh, your word um, uh, making war with our flesh. And so I pray that you would help us, Lord, to, uh, to take our thoughts captive and uh, to be obedient to, uh, to every word that we uh, read in your word. And so we pray these things because you're good and you do good. And so we pray for hearts to obey. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.